Good evening and welcome. Tonight we'll be going over the history and geography of Venezuela. Let me get my pencil. Venezuela, as you can see, is in the northern part of South America. This is the Caribbean right here. And it borders Colombia on this side, Brazil down here, and it borders Guyana. Although this border is disputed, Venezuela claims all of this section of Guyana right here. You can see the dotted line. This is the part they claim, but it is controlled by Guyana. We'll talk about it in its history. Venezuela has three-ish main geographic areas. Starting in the north, we have this big branch of mountains that goes up through here. This is part of the Andes Mountains, and they're very high, very rocky. The highest point of Venezuela is right about here, next to Merida. It is Pico Bolivar. Also in this region, we have Lake Maracaibo, the largest natural lake in South America. And as you can see, there are many cities up here, including the capital city of Caracas. This is by far the most populated area of Venezuela, not so much in the southern areas, as you'll soon find out. The coastline, of course, bordering the Caribbean, has some really beautiful beaches. And it has some islands off the coast that are also very lovely. You can see Isla de Margarita, or Margarita Island. It is considered the big vacation island, like the most uh, beautiful white sand beaches, everything like that. Um, but just to note that um, tourism is not really encouraged in Venezuela, but we'll get to that in its history. Going a little bit further south, we have the Llanos, as you can see down here. The Llanos is like the plains area of Venezuela. It's dominated by the Rio Oronoco, you can see flowing right through here, and then makes a big delta region right here. So that's a very fertile area, as you can imagine, perfect for agriculture. And being so close to the Caribbean, you can grow things like tropical fruits and things like that. And then down here, you can see the Guiana Highlands. This is like the most northern part of the Amazon rainforest. It's very, very forested and very, very mountainous. It has some really particular mountains. I did talk about this when I covered Guyana, but they have these really stunning flat-topped mountains called Tepuis. And they don't even look real. They're so beautiful. I'll show you some in this book after I go over its history. But by far the most famous site in this part of Venezuela is Angel Falls. You can see right here. Angel Falls is the highest uninterrupted waterfall in the world. Absolutely beautiful. It's actually on the cover of this book here. There's some people skydiving off of it, I suppose. But it's stunning to see. Very, very beautiful. Angel Falls is very remote. You have to hike to it or um, you have to actually fly a plane to get to it. You have to hike to get to the town where you fly the plane to see the waterfall. There's no like roads or trails or anything that goes to it. Um, a lot of different sites, like very famous mountains and things throughout Venezuela in the southern area here, you have to either go by plane or hike for a few days to get to it. It's really beautiful and remote and some very lovely, lovely places in Venezuela, but without further ado, let's get into its history. Um, humans have been living in what is now Venezuela for a very long time, from about 15,000 years ago. There were many different indigenous tribes that really flourished in this area. Um, there were the Arawaks, um, the Caribs, which if those sound familiar, they left to settle the islands out here in the Caribbean, hence the Caribs, named after them. There is also a civilization called the Timoto Suicas, who were very advanced for their time. They had 
houses, like actual houses as we think of houses today. They had irrigation for their crops. They had city planning. Very, very advanced considering the other tribes in the area were mainly just hunter-gatherers. Um, but of course, all that changed when the Europeans arrived. The first European to arrive was Christopher Columbus in 1498. He landed near the Delta region over here and remarked on how beautiful it was. He compared it to like heaven on earth. Later, Amerigo Vespucci would be exploring the coast. And when he landed over here at Maracaibo, near Lake Maracaibo, he noted that the people lived in stilt houses over the water, very much like people would do in Venice, Italy. So he called it Veneziola, or Little Venice, and translated into Spanish, you get Venezuela. At least that's the rumor of how the country could be named. It's, um, there's, there's others, but that one popped up like in all the sources that I read. Um, in 1522, Spain came to start building colonies along the coastal regions here. Of course, they met a lot of opposition from the local tribes. They resisted, but eventually failed, mostly due to the fact that you know, smallpox and other European diseases wiped them out very quickly. Um, the few tribes that would eventually surrender um, converted to Catholicism. There are, of course, many priests that came to convert the people here. Um, and for about 300 years, it worked as a typical overseas colony. It wasn't one of the big, super viable colonies that Spain had. Venezuela didn't have nearly as many of the things they were looking for, like gold or jewels, things like that. Um, it was mostly just a plantation colony, so they imported a lot of kidnapped people from Africa to work as slaves along with the original population of the area. Um, these three groups intermingled and wound up creating the mestizo population of mixed heritage. It wasn't until after the American Revolution and the French Revolution that a man named Francisco de Miranda, who was from Caracas, and had participated in both revolutions, uh, thought, why can't we do this for my home country? So in 1811, he helped organize the First Republic of Venezuela, which declared independence on July 5th, 1811. The real leader of the independence fight, though, was Simon Bolivar, and he's considered a hero all throughout South America and parts of Central America. He is, I mean, in American history, you can only really compare him to, like, George Washington, but, like, George Washington times ten, in a way. He's very beloved. There's even a statue of him outside the city hall in San Francisco here. He's a very important figure in South American history. Remember that name, because you're going to hear it in any other country I cover in South America. Um, Simone Bolivar helped lead the fight against the Spanish. The... War for Independence was known as the Admirable Campaign, and it ended with his victory at the Battle of Caribobo on June 24th, 1821. I just point that out because that's like another national holiday in Venezuela. Um, Bolivar helped create what is now known as Gran Colombia after he attained independence for Venezuela. He went on to help out other areas to free them from the Spanish, so he liberated what is now Colombia, Ecuador, it's covered up by the book, uh, Panama, uh, parts of Peru and Brazil as well. His dream was to have all of South America united into one big country, so to say, um, but it all really fell apart. There was um, a coup in 1830, um, by one of his friends, actually, another admiral named José Antonio Paez. He created the state of Venezuela and became its first president. Politically, Venezuela has been pretty rocky. I don't think, looking through its history, there's ever been a time of a stable government in Venezuela. Most of the 
government has been controlled by various types of dictatorships for the most part. So, as you can imagine, there were a lot of different coups and overthrows and various elections, what have you. So, since this is a brief history, I'm not going to go over all of them. I'm just going to mention the most important ones to its history, or else this will be a two-hour video. So, um, just quick important events in its history. Um, the political parties argued and it turned into a whole civil war between 1859 and 1863. Not long after, Venezuela tried to claim this part of Guyana. It was called British Guiana at the time. Britain was like, no, that's ours. Um, it wound up going to a tribunal in Paris that ruled that this land belongs to Britain. Venezuela still has not gotten over that. It's been like 120 years and they still claim this land. It's a whole thing. And then, starting in 1902, the current leader decided that he, wa he would not pay any of the debts he owed to Europe because of colonialism. The Europeans were not pleased about this. They formed a blockade um, that lasted from 1902 to 1903, and that ended in um, that ended with an arbitration at the Hague, where both sides, Venezuela and the European powers, came to a compromise. Um, yeah, but then everything changes for the better for Venezuela, in a way. Um, oil was discovered in Lake Maracaibo, so the economy switched from agriculture to oil drilling, and it led to a big economic boom in the area. Let's see, there were various other coups, I'm just looking through my notes to see which ones I should mention. Let's skip to the oil crisis in the 1970s. Um, that greatly helped Venezuela because the whole oil crisis had to do with dealings in the Middle East, uh, to put it very bluntly. So Venezuela greatly profited off of its oil um, until it didn't, until the crash in the 1980s when the price of oil plunged. It devastated Venezuela's economy and it's never really recovered since then. Um, the people, of course, were not happy at all, and there were a few attempted coups by some fellow named Hugo Chavez. Um, the president wound up getting impeached instead of overthrown, and um, Hugo Chavez was given a political pardon, and he rose in political prominence and wound up becoming president of Venezuela in 1999. And he kicked off what is known as the Bolivarian Revolution, where Chavez said it would be a big focus on, like, military might and, you know, and, like, bringing back the honor that Simón Bolívar had, that kind of thing. It's proved pretty disastrous for the country. Um, there have been multiple, multiple corruption protests against him. Um, he was best buddies with um, a lot of socialists, um, Fidel Castro mainly. Um, which did not put him in good light with the United States, who they, you know, really needed for money to give oil to. That hasn't gone well even still to this day. Um, Hugo Chavez passed away in 2013, and the next election was won by Nicolas Maduro, who was actually his vice president. He was picked by Hugo Chavez to become the next leader. He's still president to this day because he's one of those world leaders that just somehow keeps getting elected. It's just so bizarre how that happens. Um, Venezuela today is considered to have an extremely corrupt government. Nicolas Maduro is considered a dictator. Um, he's done a lot to try to stop the democratic process and backtracks a lot and winds up doing things anyway. Um, organized crime runs rampant. What is it? There's a person murdered every 21 minutes in Venezuela. It's why it's very, very dangerous for tourists and it's recommended that you not spend your vacations in Venezuela because 
many Taurus have um, very horrible things happen to them. Um, you know, drug trafficking is an issue. Um, government spending, there's a lot of poverty. Um, just all the hallmarks of a very poorly managed government. Um, doesn't really look like there's an end in sight at the moment, but... You know, whenever a country is facing a big down, that just means that a big up is on the way eventually. So hopefully soon brighter days come to Venezuela, but that doesn't change the fact that it's a very stunningly beautiful country. So let me show you some pictures in here so you can see what I mean. Let's see. Let's look at the positives. There's a kindly old lady there. Let me put my pencil down there. We have a physical map of Venezuela. You can see lots of the national parks there. The Orinoco River. There's a very happy looking family at the dinner table. This is Roraima Tepui, which I mentioned in my Guyana video because it's also on the border of Guyana. This is the mountain that inspired the book The Lost World by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Since it's fun to imagine when you're at the bottom that there's a whole hidden world at the top full of like dinosaurs and things. A physical map of Venezuela. You can really see how mountainous it is around here, which leads to a flat area right here. There's a river or maybe the lake down here. I don't see any little caption, but over here we can see Pico Bolivar really shows you just how rocky and craggy the Andes are. And there we go. The rainforest. Look at that. Let me move this real quick. There we go. Look at all the mist. The green. It's so beautiful. The Amazon is so pretty. And then look at this beach. We've got like the deserty looking area here, and then this gorgeous beach with this beautiful water. It looks so pleasant. Here is Lake Maracaibo, and the houses that Marigo Vespucci liked so much that he named it, he named the country after Venice. Similar houses. This is the big bridge that, let me show you where it is. Right here, connecting this land with this land right there. And right here is Valencia, which is right here, the third largest city in Venezuela, after Caracas and Maracaibo. Here's the beautiful Orinoco River, and some cowboys on the Llanos, rustling up some cows. This is the region where the Llanos meets the highlands, isn't that pretty? And here's Angel Falls. It's so beautiful. Look at the rainbows. So lovely. That must sound amazing. Look at this lightning. So this is the Catatumbo lightning. We're at the mouth of the Catatumbo River. Um, lightning strikes. What does it say? It's like um, 150 nights per year. That's amazing. Can you imagine? Here in California, we maybe have one lightning storm a year can't imagine. And being where it is in the world, it's very rainy, being so close to the Amazon rainforest after all. A jaguar. So beautiful. I love big cats. They're so amazing. We have capybaras, one of the best animals. They're so cute. And vampire pets. Ooh. A manatee, also one of the sweetest little animals in the world. There's a giant river otter. Look how cute it is. And then this is a Jabiru stork. It says it right down here. It's one of the largest birds in Venezuela. What else do we have? Birds. This is the Trupial, the national bird. And one of my favorites, the Toucan. That's why it's in the intro. And this is an Orinoco crocodile. A big chomper. What else? Here's a baby chomper down here, just hatching out of its egg. And look at this frog. It doesn't even look real. It looks like a ceramic that's been hand-painted. This is a poison arrow frog. 
the more bright and vivid the frog is, the more poisonous it is. So don't touch this frog if you ever see it out in the rainforest. There's, of course, lots of fishies throughout the rivers and the lake and the coast. The national flowers, the orchid. And they're cleaning their catch for the day. Look how big that fish is. It's like half the size of this guy. Some man, or some meat-eating plants. Really the more interesting kind of plants. This one, um, you can see it has lots of liquid down there that flies go into. And then they get stuck and sucked in and plants eat them. That's so neat. The national tree it says here is the Aranguane, I believe it's pronounced. And then, of course, beautiful tree ferns. So lovely. The history chapter is one of my favorites. This is from the Chipcha people. This is a clay vessel, it says, so this would hold water or something. Depiction of life in pre Columbian Venezuela. There's a map here of where the indigenous people lived. You can see the Arawaks, the Caribs, and up here in the mountains is the Chibcha. A map of European exploration. So let's see, Columbus. I told you he came right about here, and then left. Amerigo Vespucci came up the coast, came down to here, and then this is, oh, what's its name? It says Humboldt. This picture's later in. Uh, but he was a scientist. He, you can see he came through all the rivers and things, but he was there to study the plants and the animals. He wasn't there to conquer anyone. Speaking of conquering, there's an uprising. Those kind of look like priests. That's not good luck, but also not good luck. Here's some enslaved native people. A picture of early Caracas. And here's a cacao um, plantation. It's one of the, the big crops in Venezuela at the time. Let's see, we've got some moo cows and some hot chili peppers. Some of the stuff that was exported from Venezuela in its early days. This is the city of Coro, or Santa Ana de Coro. Um, it was the first capital, right? Yes, right there. Um, and still has a lot of beautiful historic buildings in it. Here's Simon Bolivar. He's almost always depicted on his horse like that. And let's see, there he is at the Battle of Carabobo. You can see the Venezuelan flag there. This is a map of Gran Venezuela. Gran Venezuela. Gran Colombia. So this was the borders of... Bolivar's country that he made, and this became Venezuela after 1830. What else do we have? More about Simon Bolivar in battle. And this was Jose Antonio Paez, who led the first coup in Venezuela's history and became its first president. This is him, Alexander von Humboldt. This guy was a big botanist, naturalist, what would you describe him as? A scientist. This is in Caracas. It says he's selling bread. It's cool. On his mule. The oil wells in the lake. It's this picture from 1935. And this is Juan Vicente Gomez, one of the dictators that I skipped over in its history. But, um, you know, he was, he was a big one. He was the first one to really take advantage of the oil prices. And, um, yeah, surprise, he was overthrown. Let's see. All these people, it says they're getting water on their donkeys. Kind of talking about the, the poorer people in Venezuela. There's Hugo Chavez. When this book was published, he was still alive. So the history ends there. There's a very angry protest. The National Assembly building, one that Maduro's constantly trying to take power from, but anyway. Here's the flag. Let's read about it. It says, Venezuela's flag has three broad horizontal stripes of yellow, blue, and red, with eight stars and a half circle in the middle blue stripe. Sometimes the country's coat of arms appears in the upper left corner within the yellow stripe. I 
I think as of now, it's like permanent, but anyway. Venezuela's flag has had the same three colors since the nation became independent in 1811, but this exact design dates back only to 2006. Yellow represents the wealth of the Venezuelan land, red is for courage, and blue symbolizes independence from Spain. The stars represent Venezuela's provinces. This guy's waving the flag. Here is the National Assembly in action. Really beautiful building. Caracas, the capital city. There's a surprise, it's a statue of Simon Bolivar. And a, a map, the main area. Yeah. Big oil refinery. The currency is the Bolivar, I believe. See, the Boulevard Fuerte. The um, nationalized gas in Venezuela, PDV, it's Petróleos de Venezuela. Who's this? The energy minister, at least when this book came out. And here's the oil wells at Lake Maracaibo. This guy is shoveling bauxite. There's some cacao beans, a map of the resources, so you can see all the big forest areas, the oil wells, and all the plants and animals that are like the cattle there, and the llanos, and things like that. Oh, what a sweet face. <laughs> How so cute. Good effects. Some native people. It says this was taken in 1900. Look at this painting. Don't you love paintings from this time where, like, the kids look like just very tiny, tiny adults? But it says that, you know, this portrait has a man with his mestizo wife. Let's see. Shopping in the market. And here is a Yanomami woman. You can see their typical face paint and face piercings. It's so interesting. It's a busy day. Caracas and population maps. You can really see everyone lives up here. A sign for tourists. It says it's in English and Spanish. Major indigenous language family. So as you can imagine, Spanish is widely, widely spoken, but here are still some of the indigenous languages that are still spoken. A priest at a rally. Venezuela is still incredibly Catholic. Here's some missionaries, and here's the Caracas Cathedral. This is began being built in 1666. A statue of Mary and Jesus, which I always say when there's like a Muslim-dominated country, there's always like a whole chapter on like what Islam is. Here's a section on what Catholicism is. Equal representation for all religions, I say. This is a big graveyard, but it's really beautiful. Look at all the headstones. A big parade. Almost all the major holidays involve parades of some kind in Venezuela. There's mass being held. This is Jose Gregorio Hernandez, who was a doctor who apparently in Venezuela is considered a saint there today. This is a fire walker. He's part of what this book calls the cult of Maria Leonza. We have a picture of her over here, I remember. There she is writing her tape here. She's like a goddess slash saint figure. Her religion combines um, Catholicism with a lot of tribal elements and African influences as well. So really interesting belief. Here's a guy. Um, doing something at, let's see what it says, oh, a ceremony, that's the word, a ceremony to promote good health. Looks very intense. Beautiful ballet dancers. And we have famous composer Gustavo Dudamel and this band, Los Amigos, they won a Grammy apparently. So this is the Feast of Corpus Christi, the tradition there, like I said, there's always parades 
um, you dress up like a red devil with a big mask and you run around. Um, kind of reminds me of like Krampusnacht in Germany and just cause mischief and stuff and then apparently you go to mass right after. Miss Universe contestant. Let's see, it says Venezuelan women won Miss Universe in 2008 and 2009. And this is Irene Stayez, yeah, um, who was Miss Universe 1981 and became mayor of Caracas and ran for president also, apparently. That's cool. Baseball is by far the biggest sport in Venezuela. Some kids warming up to practice. Ozzy Gillen, I believe, famous Venezuelan baseball player. And Bullfighting is still a thing in Venezuela. And this guy's selling some fruit. There's arepas, which is a staple in Venezuelan cuisine. And looks really delicious. You um, stuff it full of like, there's like a million different varieties, but it's basically like a little, um, it's basically a sandwich, but it sounds so much better. And this is the national dish, basically. It's Pabellon Criollo, where you have shredded beef, you have rice, beans, plantains, things like that. It sounds really yummy. And another beloved dish, this is Hayakis. It says that it's eaten at Christmas. And um, it definitely looks interesting. Let's see, I'm reading the thing. Beef, pork, chicken, capers, raisins, and olives wrapped in cornmeal dough, and then in plantain leaves. Very interesting. I bet it's a lot better than it looks, but... Oh, maybe I can find somewhere I can try it. Working hard in school. This is about games that kids like to play, I guess. And this is talking about how Venezuelans are those kinds of people that talk, like, with their hands all the time. This is at a cafe at Margarita Island. Carolina Herrera, very famous fashion designer from Venezuela. This girl's got her, or this woman, I should say, has her child there. What is this? Oh, how people celebrate births. And what do we have here? Houses from a poor suburb, it says, but they're still very beautifully painted. And then there's Caracas with their big high-rise apartments. And that's the end of our book tonight, so... Oh, look at this. <laughs> Very poisonous, I bet. So this was a quick one, but it's... Venezuela is one of those countries that, you know, either I just do a quick summary or it's going to be long and drawn out because they have quite an interesting history, so... Um, I do have more videos coming up this week about Venezuela, so subscribe if you haven't already. I've got um, some whisper ones coming out too about Venezuela. So anyway, thank you so much for watching. I hope you found this video relaxing and educational, and I hope that you have a very good, 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 good night. Good night. Carthaginians established settlements at sites such as Tipasa and Hipporegius, today's Anaba. She stayed afloat by being the mistress to several political figures, and in autumn of 1795, she met a young general named Napoleon Bonaparte. Napoleon fell in love with her at first sight, and immediately gave her the nickname of Josephine.